Good morning, guys, or, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, we're going to continue our study here in First Timothy this morning, and uh, it's going to be a simple message. First Timothy is not a complicated book. A lot of it's simple, but uh, it's important. If you're going to be a minister of Christ, it's important as pastors to to understand the things contained in timothy and and learn how to obey these things and uh i want to begin here in chapter 1 verse 15 where paul reminds timothy of why jesus christ came into the world and he came into the world to save sinners and as ministers of Jesus Christ, we are involved in that work with him. You know, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul said, we are laborers together with Christ. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, we then as workers together with him. And back in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he said that, that as an ambassador of Christ, he stood in Christ's stead pleading with men he stood in the in the place of jesus christ pleading with men to be reconciled unto god but what we have to understand about this ministry of salvation that we are ministers of of jesus christ salvation to sinners that doesn't mean that this ministry ends the moment you give somebody the gospel and they trust christ as their savior that is just the beginning of the ministry uh this full salvation is not just a sinner being forgiven of his sins there's been a whole doctrine committed to us for godly edification to take that that sinner that enemy of god and through this doctrine reconcile them and build them up into a new creature uh, that is pleasing unto God. And God has given us the doctrine to do this. Uh, this is what Paul calls the work of faith. Uh, back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And the work of faith is godly edification. And that is the theme of 1 Timothy. The, the, the theme of 1 Timothy is godliness. Paul mentions it in every chapter. And so as we've been looking at this, we, we've looked at the, the fact that the church epistles, Romans through 2 Thessalonians, is the doctrine we are to teach to do the work of faith. God has already given you the doctrine to teach in those church epistles. I promise you that if you teach us uh, church epistles, sorry guys, I got some phlegm this morning, but if you teach us uh, church epistles faithfully, and and you minister those epistles and people believe that doctrine then that doctrine is going to do a work of faith in edifying sinners unto godliness it's going to build and grow men up into jesus christ and all things now these pastoral epistles are special instructions given to the ministers of that doctrine uh, so the, the, the church epistles are the doctrine we are to teach. These pastoral epistles are special instructions that we as ministers need to carry on and perform this ministry. And so as a minister of Christ, you need to commit these, these things in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. You need to have these things committed to memory because you're going to need these instructions and obey these epistles in order to carry on this ministry faithfully. In fact, the first one of the first things Paul tells Timothy in first one and first Timothy 118 is this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. And so these these things written to Timothy here in First Timothy 
is given to Timothy so that he can war a good warfare by these things. And so, and so, uh, as a minister of Christ, you are a soldier. And this stuff don't get talked about enough, but but over in 2 Timothy chapter 1, or 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, Paul tells Timothy, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And so as a minister, you've been chosen of Jesus Christ to be a good soldier. And, and he's chosen you to be a soldier. And in order to please the one who chose you to be a soldier, you can't be entangled with the affairs of this life. And as a, as a soldier, we are not fighting, as he said in Ephesians 6, 12, we're not warring against flesh and blood. We're warring against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness that is in high places. And that spirit of this world, it now works in the children of disobedience. And so what our warfare is actually against is against that spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, in the in the minds and in the hearts of men. Uh, look over in Second Corinthians real quick. I'll show you what the warfare is about. Second Corinthians chapter ten. Beginning in verse number three. Paul says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And so the warfare we are commit, we are the warfare we are conducting is the pulling down of strongholds. And in order to pull down those strongholds, we have to war with the weapons that God has given us, and they're not carnal. Now he says in verse number five, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And so what our warfare is about is it's a warfare conducted by the word of God against the imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We are, we are, we are conducting warfare against imaginations and knowledge that is against God. And, and as we use the word of God, we are casting down these imaginations and these, this knowledge that is against God. And we are bringing men, we are bringing every thought of man in the captivity to the obedience of Christ. We are literally conducting warfare to cast down enemies and to bring men into captivity for Jesus Christ, to bring their minds in subjection and into, into obedience of Christ. And that's the warfare we're conducting. The ministry is a warfare. And as a minister, you are a soldier of Jesus Christ, and you have to use the word of God to conduct this warfare but Paul says that this charge that he's given to Timothy is so that he can conduct a war a, and war a good warfare. And so as a minister, guys, you really need to understand and to put into practice these things here in First Timothy. And like I said, none of these things are deep. None of these things are, are appeasing to the flesh. They're just basic, common instructions for the minister so that he can war a good warfare. Now in, in 1 Timothy, where we're going to focus this morning, chapter 2 and chapter 3, Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15 that he writes these things unto him. He says, these things write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, 
that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. And so these, these things are being written by Paul to Timothy so that Timothy knows how to behave himself in the house of God. And so this, this first section of 1 Timothy, chapter 2 and chapter 3, is about godly behavior within God's house. You know, as a Christian, as a saved individual, as a sinner that's been saved and redeemed by the blood of Christ, there is a behavior that is becoming, and, and there is a behavior that the saints should carry out as the house of God. There is a behavior that we are to have. And you don't, in America, you don't hear about this stuff. People think, people think that because Jesus Christ died for them, it's perfectly okay for them to live any way they want to. And there's nothing further from the truth. We, we as saved people are the house of God. We are the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And as, as saved men and women, there is a behavior that we are to represent as the house of God. There is a godly behavior that, that, that the doctrine that we're talking about, this doctrine of godly edification, this should produce a behavior within the house of God that is becoming of God's people. And so it's not okay just to live any way we want to live just because we're saved and forgiven all sins. Uh, Paul says, Paul tells Timothy here, there's a way that you ought to behave yourself in the house of God. And I write these things unto you so that you know how to maintain this behavior that is becoming of godliness. And so in 1 Timothy 2.8, speaking of this behavior, uh, Paul deals in chapter two, he deals with men and women, men and women, just general men and women that are in the house of God. And the thing that he lays out here about men, and it's, it's the stuff's very simple, but Paul says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So the doctrine, this doctrine and godly edification should produce godly men that pray. One of the behave, one of the main behaviors of a, of a man that professes godliness is he's a man that prays without wrath and doubting. Back in Thessalonians, Paul told the, the Thessalonians back in chapter in, in chapter five, he says, pray without ceasing. Uh, a godly, a godly man's life should be a life that is constant in prayer. He should be praying every day, everywhere. But when we when we talk about this, you got to understand this prayer in context. It ain't saying that you pray to God about all your problems, that you pray to God to fix everything going on in your life. The context of this is prayer being made for all men. And that the context is that God will have all men to be saved. Remember, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And God's will is for all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. And so what our prayer life should be about, our prayer life should be in the will of God and in, in wanting to see all men saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And so when he says without wrath and doubting, it means that our prayer life, that men should be praying about the salvation of all men. We should be praying to God about the, the salvation of all men and wanting to see all men come to the knowledge of the truth and be edified unto godliness. And it's so it, this prayer is not about you. You are to do it without wrath. You are not to have things in your heart against other men and doubting. That is, that is having a, a, a doubting mind about the men around you. Your heart should be fixed in what you want to see for other men. I don't care what my neighbor is. I don't care what the guy on the street is. 
I want to see him saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And if you're if you're in constant prayer to God about these things inwardly, then it's going to impact the way you live your life towards other men. If you're constantly praying to God about the salvation and edification of all men uh, without wrath and doubting, then that's going to impact the way you live your life towards your brother. Paul says that this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. It is good and acceptable in the sight of God when we pray for all men, for kings, for all that are in authority, for our neighbors, for, for the drug addict on the street, for the, the prostitute. It, it is good and acceptable in the sight of God when men pray everywhere. That is godly behavior backbiting is not godly behavior judging is not godly behavior or or judging others condemning others backbiting whispering tattletaling about other people's problems and all this other stuff that is not behavior becoming of a saint and becoming of godliness behavior that is good and acceptable in the sight of god is when we come to him and pray and intercede on the behalf of all men without wrath and doubting when we truly in our hearts want nothing more than to see all men saved that is what the house of god that's what men in god's house should be um obsessed with men in the house of god should be praying everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting and so that's a very basic instruction for men. Men, you want to know how to behave yourself? Pray. Spend time in prayer without wrath and doubting. Then he comes down here and he talks about women. Very, very simple instruction for godly women also. He says in verse 9, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves. Now, Watch what he tells a woman to adorn herself with. Modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety. Then he says, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So he actually says there's four things here that a woman should adorn herself with. Modesty, shamefacedness, sobriety, and good works the, the 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 point paul's making here is that godly women should not care about their outward appearance that they should not just be beautifying and and making the outward woman pretty that what a what a godly woman should be adorned with what the way she should be clothed is with modest apparel shame facing the sobriety and good works you know over over in proverbs it says that as as a as a jewel of gold is in in a in a swine snout so is a fair woman without discretion outward beauty is nothing in a woman without discretion you know, it's the same thing as putting a, a jewel of gold in the in the nose of a pig for a woman to be pretty but not have discretion. You know, over in, in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, this is the this is the kind of stuff in the Bible that modern people hate. They 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 think this stuff is outdated. But I'll just read you what the Bible says. Peter writing about women in 1 Peter chapter 3 says, Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. Notice what God, it ain't about me, it ain't about men, it ain't about masculinity or any of this other stuff feminists talk about. It's about God, your creator. 
and what what God says is of great price in his sight just like it's good and acceptable in the sight of God for men to pray it is great it is it is of great value in the sight of God when a woman is adorned with a meek and quiet spirit you know, over there in Proverbs, it talks about the harlot, the, the, the woman that's dressed in a harlot's apparel, that she is loud and stubborn and rebellious, and her feet stay not at home. You know, th those things, a loud, stubborn, rebellious woman is in the sight of God, not of great price. Now listen what he says here, for after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves. How? With a quiet, meek spirit. Being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed, obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. And so Paul's Paul's laying out here godly behavior of men and women. Men, you pray everywhere. Women, you be adorned in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. Don't worry about adorning the outward woman with all this superficial uh, 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 beauty that's not real. The fixing up of hair and gold and pearls and costly array. He said, worry more about adorning yourself with good works. This is the point Paul's making, is, is that a godly woman is, or, is adorned with good works, not costly array. Notice what he says there in verse 10. But which becometh women professing godliness? What's becoming of a woman professing godliness? That she has good works. If she professes godliness, let her have good works. That's what Paul's saying. Now, listen, none of this is hard. Like I've already said, this is not deep stuff. None of it's hard. It's easy. Men, you pray. You pray for all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Women, you be modest, sober, and have good works. There's nothing hard about it. It's just that men and women are rebellious. They don't do these things. They always got an excuse. When you say pray for all men, well, well you don't know what so-and-so did to, to me, or, or you don't know this, you don't know that. Women, adorn yourselves in modest apparel with sobriety and good work. Well, you, you just don't understand. That's rebellion. This is what godly men and godly women do. If a woman is truly godly, she will have no problem doing what Paul says here. She will have no problem adorning herself in modesty with sobriety and good works. She won't have a problem with it in world. If she has a problem with it, then her godliness ain't worth five cents. All she has is a profession. She don't have any true godliness, right? Now we're gonna get in more trouble with this passage. Paul says, let the women learn all right, so I, I want to stop right there and say, Paul wants women to learn. He wants them to learn the Bible. He wants them to learn doctrine. But I want you to notice how he says, let the women learn. He doesn't say cast them out and don't let them learn. He says, let the women learn, but notice how they are to learn in silence with all subjection. Once again, Nothing hard to understand. It's easy to understand. It's just that people don't want to obey it. People want to rebel. People, people don't want to listen to God. They don't want to listen to God's instruction. And then they wonder why our churches are in a mess. They want to know why families are in a mess, why the world around them is going to hell and why it's falling apart. It's because God says these little simple things in his word to, to promote godliness and good behavior, and people don't want to listen to it. They want to rebel against it. Paul says, let the women learn in silence with all subjection. There's nothing hard to understand that. 
about that. It means women, when, when the Bible is being taught, when the church comes together to be taught and to, to, to learn doctrine from the word of God, women are to learn, they are to be there, but they are to be there in silence. They are to be in silence while the word of God is being taught. And they are to be in silence with all, sub, uh, with all subjection. It means to be, to be in subjection means to be under the authority of something higher than yourself. And I'm sorry, when the word of God is open and when the word of God is being taught, that is the highest authority in heaven and earth. And if it says for women to sit there in silence under authority of the word of God, then they need to do it. And there's no loopholes for it. It's, it says what it says. Women, you want to learn the Bible? Come to church, learn the Bible in silence with all subjection. In contrast to this, Paul says, but I suffer not a woman to teach. So they can learn, let the women learn. He says, but I suffer not a woman to teach. So let the women learn, not teach. That's simple. A woman is not to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man. That goes back to silence and subjection. So they are not to teach. They are to be in silence. They are to be in subjection. That means not to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. To usurp authority means to take possession of something that you have no right to. And when women teach and, and, and try to have authority over men, they are usurping authority, taking possession of authority that God did not give them. And these, listen, I'm, I'm sorry, this stuff, there will be an accounting for this stuff in the, in the judgment seat of Christ. If, if this is what a godly woman does, a godly woman adorns herself in modesty, sobriety, good works, and she learns in silence with all subjection. She doesn't try to teach and usurp authority over the man that God did not give her. God never gave women authority over men. Paul says, when you come together in the church, let the women learn in silence. He said it again back in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul says, um, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. There's no permission given for them to speak in the churches. He says, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, I, 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 I read these things, I, I, I quote these things, I preach these things, and I'm always made out to be the bad guy. This is the word of God. Take it up with him. He's the one that said it's not permitted for them to speak, but to be under obedience. This is, this is what the Bible says. Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'm telling you, you ministers of God, ye men that are put in charge of overseeing a church, these are things that you have to, these are things you have to teach. These are, these, this is how, these are things that have to be taught and obeyed in order for there to be godly behavior within the house of God. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 7. For, it, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image, of, image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. 
listen to me. God, I mean, let, let's 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 look at it here. We'll, we'll go back to this verse in Corinthians, but I want to I want to point this verse out. Why should a woman be in silence and subjection? First reason: for Adam was first formed, then Eve. Listen to me, and listen to me carefully. God formed the man for himself. This is not about, you know, the battle between the sexes and who's smarter. God created Adam. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 and 7 that the man is the image and glory of God. Adam was created to be the image and glory of God. It's not about men and women. It's about what God created. God first created man for his image and his glory, and then he created the woman for the man. And when that when those things are overstepped, as Paul said, the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So there's your order. God Jesus Christ, his image, man under the headship of Christ, and women under the headship of men. That is God's ordained order of, of hierarchy. And when we overstep these things, man, I don't care what you think about it or what you think of me. This is what the Bible says. Adam was created for, for God to be his image and his glory, and God created the woman for the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. And when women try to usurp authority over the man, they are, they are, they are overstepping. If man was created for God's image and glory, when women try to usurp that authority over the man, instead of being what God created them to be for the man, they are robbing God of his image and glory. Now do with this stuff what you will, guys. This is godliness. And I know in some cultures around the world that you have what we call matriarchs, where the women have all the authority. It was usually in pagan, heathenistic cultures. But the Bible is clear that man was created first to be the image and glory of God and the woman was created for the man. And so in a godly house, the man is the head and the woman is, is in submission to the man. She's in obedience to the man. And the man under the headship of Christ, he is to love his wife the same way Christ taught the church, to love the church. And the woman is to be is to obey her husband the way that the, the church is to obey Christ. And that's what a godly family looks like. Anytime the husband don't love his wife the way he's supposed to, he's not being godly. And anytime the woman is seeking to usurp authority from that man, she's not being godly. And that's just the end of it, guys. This is about godly behavior. And so the first, the first reason Paul says that a woman is not to teach nor usurp authority is because Adam was created first. God created Adam first. And the second reason he gives here is, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. And so he goes back to the woman's deception. You see, the woman was created for the man. And when she, when she, you know, usurped that authority and had the conversation with the serpent, right? And she, 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 she went above and beyond her creative purpose. She was deceived. Adam was not deceived. Adam willfully ate of that tree because he's one with his wife. 
I believe Adam ate of that tree to die with her so that she wouldn't bear this, this punishment alone. It was done out of love. The woman was deceived. And this is the, the two reasons Paul says, listen, women are not to teach nor usurp authority. Why? Number one, Adam was created first and the woman was created for him. Number two, the woman was deceived and being deceived was in the transgression. And so I've watched this stuff. I've watched this stuff over, over years and years and years. Any denomination of Christianity that makes a habit of putting women in authority and letting them teach the Bible, usually them churches become a bunch of feeling, emotionalistic churches that have no regard for the word of God. Their doctrine is all over the place, and it is a bunch of deceived people that don't even know what the Bible says. Pentecostalism is a great example of it here in America. It is a church of women and for women and by women. And usually it's it's ran by a bunch of women that, that leave their home. And I, I'm, this is this is not meant to to degrade or 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 berate women this morning, guys. It's just the material that's in the pastoral epistles that we have to to address. And and women women are a very easily deceived creature. When they step out of the out of the realm of what they were created for, you know, Peter calls them a weaker vessel, and all these things. And they they listen. Women have been convinced today, especially here in America, that they can go out here and be like men and live in a man's world. And women are being devoured in America left and right because they're overstepping what God created them to do and to be. And Paul, Paul, when it comes to this deception that she being deceived was in the transgression, he says, notwithstanding, she shall be saved. Now, we got to understand the context of what he's saying here, that, that women, because the woman was deceived and was in the transgression. So when he talks about salvation here, he's talking about women being saved from deception and she will be saved from deception in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety now guys listen at the end of the day i can't do anything about stubborn rebellious women who don't like this doctrine any more than i can do about a rebellious man who doesn't want to submit his life to the word of god either but I'm going to tell you right now, the safest place for a woman in this world, the safest place for a woman in this world is in her home, bearing children, keeping her home, and obeying her husband. That is the safest place for a woman, is in her home, raising her children, minding her business, and being in obedience to her husband. And if she's got a godly husband that, that, that is in obedience to Jesus Christ and she submits to him and obeys him and focuses her time on providing good works, adorning herself with good works, providing for her home, raising her kids, if they do that, then they, they will be safe. They'll be saved in childbearing. Do with that what you will. I know it's not popular doctrine today. I know it's not, but you do with it what you will. But I'm just warning you. I'm, I'm war I, listen, I, I do this because I love women and I love men. And I'm telling women right now, they're never going to find, they're never going to find true happiness trying to be a man. All they're going to find is trouble and vanity and all this stuff. Women will find fulfillment and safety. In, in bearing children, keeping their home, and obeying their husbands. And you know, this actually goes back to what God said in Genesis 3.16. Look at Genesis 3.16 real quick. Then we'll move on from this. Genesis 3.16. 
And listen, guys, if you're if you're going to be ministers of Christ, these are the uncomfortable subjects that you're going to have to deal with. And you're going to get a lot of hatred for it. Um, Genesis 3, 16, unto the woman, he said, this is God speaking to the woman. I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow, thou shalt bring forth children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Not, not just any man. The husband, the woman's desire is to her husband, and he shall rule over thee, the husband. It's not, it's not okay for women to go to another man and try to have him rule over her. Because she don't like the way her husband's doing things. And I tell ladies all the time, if you have trouble, you know, you can come to me. But ultimately, we're going to have to deal with you and your husband because I'm not your husband. I have one wife. And, and I'm, not, I'm not the head of another man's home. A woman, a woman's responsibility is to obey her own husband. So it's not just men in general. She is to be obedient to her husband. God, God told the woman, listen, because, because you did this, you were deceived. Your desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. That's God talking. Don't take it out on Paul Lucas. All right, now we come into chapter three. And now Paul's going to focus. He's, he's, so listen, what he's laid out this far is men, you pray. Women, you adorn yourselves with modesty and good works. And these things, learn in silence with all subjection. Don't seek to, to teach nor to usurp authority over a man, but, but be in obedience. Raise your kids, continue in faith, charity, holiness with sobriety. Now, now Paul comes in here and comes down here and he starts talking about offices within the church. And he talks about two offices, that of a bishop and that of a deacon. In fact, when he wrote Philippians, we know these two offices are the two offices within the church because when he writes Philippians, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. And so these are two offices within the house of God, the church, a bishop and a deacon. <clears throat> and every church should have these, uh, a bishop. Uh, you, you have elders, things of that nature, but but a bishop and an elder are pretty much the same office. And what a what a bishop is is he's an overseer. He's one who oversees the church. And not only does he oversee the church, he directs the work within that church. A deacon, uh, the word deacon simply means servant or minister. And so. In a church, you have a bishop or bishops sometimes overseeing the church and directing the work of that church. And then you have deacons within that church that are that are ministering and serving uh, in an office that that does this work of a, of a servant and of a, of a deacon. And so understanding these two offices, but more importantly, in order that so these two offices are are about um establishing order within the house of god and more important than the office is the behavior that is required of those in that office and so before a man can become a bishop before he can become a deacon he must first be proved means he he must he must be examined and he must be found to be a man that fits these qualifications of a bishop. 
right? So let's look at them here. First Timothy 3, 2. A bishop then must be blameless. Now, he didn't say sinless. He didn't say perfect. He didn't say a man without errors. He must be blameless. And in order to be blameless, he's getting ready to lay out what being blameless is, right? And so you can't just put your own standard of blameless on there and then find a fault in your pastor or your bishop and say, oh, you're not qualified because you did this or you done that. Paul's getting ready to lay out what blameless is, right? A bishop then must be blameless. Now, here he goes, the husband of one wife. And so in order to be a bishop, a man must be a husband and a husband of one wife, meaning he can't have multiple wives. He can't be a polygamist. Uh, so that disqualifies, <laughs> that disqualifies uh, the Mormons who thinks it's, it's more godly to be married to more than one woman. And it also disqualifies every bishop in the Catholic Church because the bishops in the Catholic Church don't have a wife. He must be, this is what he says, a bishop thus must then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. You can't be a, a, bish, a, a, a bachelor. You can't be an unmarried man and be a bishop in a church. Doesn't mean you can't teach the Bible or that you can't preach. You can't be a bishop. A bishop must be the husband of one wife. Vigilant. Uh, to be vigilant, I don't know if y'all have ever heard of a, ving a vigilante, but he's a, to be vigilant means that you're, you're you're always at task. You're you're constantly on guard. You're watching everything around you. Not only are you, uh, not only are you there to teach the church and to be vigilant and and want to see this church do good works and and be a godly church, but you're on guard against enemies trying to sneak in and pervert that church. You know, Paul, Paul said over there when he said that about warring a good or that, you know, casting down imaginations, and he says, and having a readiness to avenge all disobedience, to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. A bishop must be a man that is ready, that is ready to stand and judge and execute discipline within the church, not a pushover, not somebody that overlooks stuff but a man that, that is vigilant in the work, protecting the church, judging, and, 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 and if, if necessary, casting people off, putting them out of the church, that they don't corrupt the church and things of that nature, just like Paul did the fornicator in 1 Corinthians. And so he must be a man that's vigilant, sober, of good behavior, these, these things are self-explanatory, guys. Given the hospitality, he must be a man that's given the hospitality, providing, uh, for example, providing clothing or, or money or food or, or shelter to those that are in need. A man that, that is hospitable. He must be apt to teach. That means he must have an ability and a desire to teach not given to wine. He can't be a drunkard, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient. He must be a patient man, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Why? For if a man no not no, not for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And then he says, and so a man must first show himself capable of ruling his own home before you make him an overseer of God's house. If he can't rule his own house, how can he oversee the house and the church of God? And when it talks about his children being in subjection, it means his children. You don't judge a man based on what 
his his child is doing when he's 30, 40 years old. That's out of his control. If he has children, then they are to be in subjection. They're not to be uh, a loud, obnoxious, stubborn, unruly kids. They are to be they are to be children that are in subjection with all gravity, well behaved children. Verse number six, not a novice. Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Uh, means you don't take a man that is new. Novice means new. Green. It means to be green, not not a man of experience. And the condemnation of the devil there is the devil. The devil, because of the position God gave him. He got lifted up with pride of, of self-importance, not realizing it was God that set him there. It was God who made him what he was. And, and, and a man who's a novice, when you put him in a position of great authority, he can become lifted up with pride and fall into that same condemnation of the devil. And so a bishop cannot be a novice. Moreover, he must have a good report of them that are with, of them which are without, meaning uh, lost people. Uh, lost people should give a good report of this man, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So we see there the condemnation of the devil and the snare of the devil. A man cannot be a novice, and he must have a, a good report with them that are without, lest he fall into condemnation of the devil and fall into the snare of the devil. And so these things are about bishops, guys. These are these are mandatory uh, qualities within a, a bishop. And like I said, there's nothing hard to understand them. But as as a as a minister of Christ set over the church of God, when it comes to appointing bishops and deacons this stuff is important that we don't just a man comes to church and say hey i want to be a deacon and then you're okay you can be a deacon i've seen that stuff too much in christianity and you end up with a bunch of people that are not qualified for these positions and 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 the church suffers for it right so now he comes into deacons here deacons likewise must the deacons be grave? That means serious. They must be men that are serious and they take the job serious. Not double tongued. That means they're not hypocrites. They don't they don't go around uh, saying different things. A double tongued man is a man that says one thing here, and then as soon as he gets around other people, he says another thing. He must be a man that's serious and not a double-tongued man, a man that speaks the word of God regardless of who's listening. Not given to much wine, can't be a drunkard. Not greedy, a filthy lucre. He can't be covetous and, and a lover of money. Then he says, uh, verse 9, if you look there in 1 Timothy 3, 9, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Now, I take that to mean that if a deacon can't expound the mystery of the faith, if you ask a man, a man says, I want to be a deacon, you say, okay, can you, one of the things you should ask is, can you tell me what the mystery of the faith is? Because one of the things he must have is he must hold the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. He must have a pure conscience when it comes to the mystery of the faith. Same thing Paul told Timothy earlier on about holding faith in a good conscience. When he tells him the war, good warfare. How do you? How do I war this good warfare, Paul? Holding faith and a good conscience. And so a deacon must hold the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Verse 10, let these also first be proved. Don't just put them in an office of a deacon. Let them be proved, just like the bishop. 
the same thing there. If a man wants to be a bishop, he must be blameless then. That means he must be the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, good behavior. Same thing with a deacon. Man wants to be a deacon. He wants to hold the office of a deacon. Let him first be proved. Judge him first. Try him. Prove him. See if they fit the qualifications. He says, let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless, just like a bishop. Prove them. Then let them use the office when they've been found blameless. Now, Paul says something here about deacons that he didn't say about bishops. And I don't know why other than they have different responsibilities because I, I believe as a, as a deacon, when a, when a man is a deacon, he's a servant and a minister of the church. And there's going to be times when his wife is going to be with him. A bishop is, a, is an authority oversee, but a deacon is going to be doing multiple ministries within the church. And there's going to be times when his, his wife is going to be useful in those, in those ministries that he's performing. And so he says there that even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. And so there's even qualifications for the wife of a deacon. So a deacon must be proved, found blameless, and their wives also must be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And what I, what I think Paul's saying there in verse 13, they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree i, I believe this i believe this is dealing uh, uh in this life and in the life to come i believe if a man uses the office of a deacon well he purchases to himself a good degree that, that means a a a valuable good standing within the church and, and that allows him to have great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. But also believe that deacons who serve in that office well, they, they perform that office of deacon, of servant and minister to the church. And when they, when they do that well, I believe they're purchasing to themselves a good degree in the world to come also. Just like Christ said about the servants back there in Matthew, you were faithful over little, be thou ruler over much. And when I believe when deacons use this office and they, they do it well, they are purchasing to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I, I believe that boldness that is in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus, has to do with that coming judgment and, and things of that nature. But these, this, so, so we've looked at it, guys, and, and I'm going to close this morning. And next week we're going to get into Jordan. The next time we're going to we're going to finish out First Timothy with chapter four, five, and six. I don't know how many more weeks we got in this quarter, um, but I would like to teach chapter four, five, and six, and I'd at least like to have one week to talk about some things in Second Timothy. But this is this was all about godly behavior in the church, in the house of God. For men to pray, that godliness concerning women, a woman that professes godliness should be adorned with good work. She should be in silence, in subjection, learning the doctrine of God, learning the Bible, not seeking to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man. Uh, bishops within the church, overseers of the church, and their 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 behavior as bishops, deacons. And Paul sums it up here with these things right unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself, watch this, in the house of God, 
what is the house of God? The church of the living God. The house of God is the church that he has called out to be the house of the living God. The, the church is the house that, that is indwelt by the life of God. Paul said it back in Ephesians that we are built together for a habitation of God through the spirit. The church is to be a, a people that is indwelt by the living God. I will dwell in them and I will walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people as Paul said in 2 Corinthians. We as the church, are the pillar and ground of the truth, the very dwelling place of God, the creator of heaven and earth. And he finishes now by saying, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, meaning it is not open to debate. These, this, this, this mystery of godliness is not open to debate. You know, you either get on board or you don't, but we're not going to argue about it. This church is being called out by Jesus Christ, by God the Father. It's being saved by Jesus Christ and this doctrine. And God is building up a people to be the pillar and the ground of the truth, the very dwelling place of God. And, and Paul says it is without controversy. God, now a lot of people think this is just about Christ here. But Christ, when he was raised from the dead, he become the head of the church, which is his body. And that church is the house of the living God. And so when Paul says this stuff here, it's not just about the incarnation of Christ, because if it's just about Christ, it's out of order. Because it says God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now, if that's just about Jesus Christ, then it's out of order because Christ was received up into glory long before he was preached unto the Gentiles and believed on in the world. I believe this whole, this whole mystery of godliness is about this, this mystery of God's work in creating this church. And that God, remember, remember, we are the house of God, the church of the living God. God indwells this church, the body of Christ. And through that body of Christ, he's manifest in the flesh. He is justified in the spirit. God has been seen of angels in the church. The church is manifesting godliness. And it's being seen of the angels. It's being, God is being preached unto the Gentiles. God is being believed on in the world. God is being received up into glory. When that church, when this church, the body of Christ is raptured out of here, God in that church, God that indwells that church is being received up into glory also with his church. And so there's much more there, guys, than just the incarnation of Christ. This, this, is about, this is about the mystery of godliness, what God is doing through this doctrine and through this salvation in the creation of this church. He is manifesting, being seen, being preached, being believed on, and going to be received up into glory when that church goes up. And Paul, coming into chapter 4, and where we're going to go next, next time, Paul comes into chapter 4. Now, he said it's without controversy. And then in chapter 4, he says, The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. So this, this stuff he just talked about, the mystery of godliness, is what he calls the faith. And the faith is what produces godliness. The faith not church, not Christianity. There is a doctrine in the Bible called the faith that when it's taught, preached, it produces this work of godliness. And, and, and Paul says that there's going to come a time when men depart from this faith that produces godliness, and they're going to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils 
and and what they what what the what the lies and the or what the seducing spirits and doctrines of devils do is they tell you that godliness can be attained through bodily exercise bodily discipline don't eat meat abstain from marriage uh keep this ordinance do this they make they make godliness a discipline of the body whereas true godliness true godliness is produced by the faith the doctrine of god working effectually in our hearts when we believe it that's what produces true godliness and paul's saying there's going to come a time timothy when men depart this faith that produces true godliness and they're going to they're going to become men who who seek godliness through bodily exercise and through bodily discipline profane and old wise fables and all this stuff and so next time we'll, we're, we're going to cover chapter four through six we we've got this morning we did chapter two chapter three and next time we're going to do chapter four through six and and look at what paul tells timothy to do uh concerning this coming departure he's he says he's basically telling timothy look the spirit has expressly warned this is going to happen men are going to depart they're going to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and he tells timothy what to do in order to save himself and those that hear him he's saying timothy do this and you will save yourself and them that hear thee what from this coming apostasy and departure the vast majority of christianity guys is in an apostate uh, a mindset they've departed these things but he says timothy if you do what i'm telling you then you're going to save yourself from this departure this apostasy and you're also going to save the ones that hear thee and that's that's one of the things it's our responsibility to do is uh there's there's all kinds of people out there professing christianity that have departed the faith and are wrapped up in apostate religion and it is our responsibility to teach and to conduct ourselves in a way that we can save those people we'll, we'll get into chapter four next time